Good morning. Welcome to day two of ADA and temporary traffic control, building accessible and detectable work zones. This is Victoria Beal with the Ohio LTAP Center, and I'm so pleased for the second day in a row to have my colleague, Dr. Ron Eck from the West Virginia LTAP Center, who's going to be your presenter today. A few housekeeping items, and then we'll get things rolling. Um, if you haven't found it yet, if you could please find the question box in the GoToWebinar panel and drop me a hi or hello, just so I know that you know where that's at and that you are prepared if you have questions to put them in there. We're going to take questions throughout the webinar today and um, definitely look at addressing those. When we get to the end, we um, were a little bit behind on the subject matter from yesterday, so I want to make certain that um, we have time to get through everything today and Ron and I discussed strategy and that's what we're going to do is just move forward with the information and then we'll circle back around on questions and he has some answers for some questions that came in yesterday that we didn't get to. He'll be going over first this morning and then there are a few questions he's just going to reach out to you directly on um, for those of you who have had some more technical questions. So the other thing we have for you first off this morning is a poll. I'm going to go ahead and put that up. So if you don't mind answering this, and the poll really is focused more for public agencies, um, but we'd like to know, you know, to date, um, has your agency received any complaints or lawsuits regarding work zone accessibility? So yes, no, if you don't know, that's okay. Just let us know. Um, if you are not able to answer in the poll, then go ahead and um, hit the escape button and that should take you out of full screen mode to make it so you can um, go ahead and vote on that and Ron they are voting fast and furious in there so we should hopefully have some full answers here in a second right. the last thing I want to mention is there's only one handout in the handout section today and that's just a copy of the slides so if you're interested, please go ahead and download those. I'll, um, I did send a link out in yesterday's email, yesterday evening, um, but I'll send a link out again today when the webinar is finished with those attached. So, all right, I'm gonna close that poll down because we've had a good response and I'm gonna share the results. We have 14% that voted yes, 20% who have voted no, and 66% that voted don't know. And we had a person in the box that question box and answered yes as well. So that's where we're at. So Ron, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Thank All you, your... Victoria. Mm -hmm. Welcome back everyone for day two. Uh, as Victoria said, there were a number of great questions. She emailed those to me. Uh, there were a number of questions on detectable warning surfaces and crosswalks. Uh, since those are a little bit outside of the scope of the class, I will email responses to those questions individually uh, rather than take up the class time. But uh, there were some other good questions that we should probably talk about. Uh, and one here before we get into my slides was requirements for landings at ramps. And uh, that landing means to me the level space, less than 2% uh, cross slope. There, and actually the current terminology that people prefer is turning space, which is I think better describe what that space is used for. They are a turning space, level turning space is required at the top of ramps. At the bottom of the ramps, if you look at PROAG, it talks about clear space. That has a four by four foot clear space at the bottom of the ramp. That is just space. It does not have to be level. But a good practice, especially on steeply cross sloped streets, if you can do it, if you can do it, a good practice would be to put in a two foot level section at the base of the ramp. It makes it a lot more friendlier for users. And kind of speaking of that level space, another question was, uh, does PROAG require flat sections periodically along a steep street? Recall I mentioned yesterday the grade of the sidewalk can follow the street grade. Uh, no, there's no requirement in that regard. Again, it, I guess if you could do it, put in a level kind of resting area for folks, that would be great, but there's no requirement in PROAG to do so. 
another question was, do I recommend that brick or textured crosswalks not be used? And the answer, my answer, my opinion is yes. I hate to sound like an engineer who doesn't appreciate aesthetics or beauty or that sort of thing, but the, my main concern is, as I mentioned yesterday, people with certain types of spinal cord injuries that are in wheelchairs, vibration can be excruciatingly painful for them. So my preference would be to make the walking surfaces smooth surfaces. And if you want to do any texturing or color, that sort of thing, to do it in the border area. Now, I know on crosswalks, that's you really can't do that. But to me, crosswalks should be smooth, as should the walking or travel portion of other pathways and sidewalks. Uh, there was also a question about My slides will move here. There we go. Someone asked about guide dogs and sort of what they can or can't do. So I've added a couple slides here. And I should mention dog guides are probably the iconic representation of an individual who's blind, right? We've all seen that, the handler with their service animal. But the truth is really only a relatively small proportion of legally blind pedestrians use the dogs. Most of them use the white canes. But for those that do use dogs, this is what guide dogs can do. You can see they can follow a path, and they can stop at curbs, but they can't make a decision about when to cross. And interestingly, they can't follow crosswalk lines. Basically what they're taught is to head for the nearest curb. So that's what they will do. And it may be not maybe skewed a little bit compared to the crosswalk. They they don't follow crosswalk lines. So hopefully that's helpful. If that didn't answer the question, please follow up, and I'll I'll try to get you a more specific response. We had another question about uh, detectable warnings at bike ramps, and I did some investigation into this. Apparently, this is still uh, not sure. There's complete agreement on how to do it. This comes from the FHWA Office of Safety, and it may need some explanation. So this is the crossing island. That, the roundabout is over here on the, the right. It's basically out of view. But this would be the pedestrian path through the splitter island, and you see the detectable warnings. This is the bike ramp. And here, this is where the bikes would enter the sidewalk. And if you look, it's hard to see, and this is a little bit misleading because of its kind of optical perception. But the point is, notice the detectable warnings are right at, they're at the top of the ramp at the sidewalk. They're not at the bottom of the ramp at the street. And I have seen that at one or two places where I've been traveling. Another approach, and just to back up a minute, there's a whole topic of what's called tactile walking surface indicators. We've talked about the detectable warning surface here on the left. I, I said yesterday it's used to indicate road crossings to the visually impaired. And, <clears throat> excuse me, PROAG gives definite specifications for them in terms of their dimensions and their height and everything. Something else that maybe some of you have seen, maybe some of you are using it, are what are called the directional indicator surfaces or guidance surfaces. These have been used in Europe and Asia probably for decades, although there's no real standardization of them. And certainly there is no US standard for either the geometry or the use. But notice it's a like a plastic or other material surface, and then it has these longitudinal bars or ridges, if you will, kind of low, low featured. And they are intended to guide the visually impaired. There is currently a transit cooperative research project uh, under the Transportation Research Board that is investigating these surfaces and their use. So I hope within a year or two or three, there will be some better guidance in the United States. I am aware that Seattle, the city of Seattle, is using some of these in different applications. And so I'm th this I just got off of Google, so please don't ask me any questions about the, the corner. All I know is what I see here. But notice it's kind of a busy intersection corner you can see the sidewalks here 
and here, and so we have the detectable warnings, but there's also like a separated bike lane here and over here. So notice the greenish ramps are a part of the bike facility. And if you look closely, you can see the yellow surfaces at the top of the bike ramp. And so my next slide, this is just a blow up. This is a blow up of what I had circled in the previous slide. So this is, this is the detectable warning over here. This is the pedestrian ramp. This is the bike ramp. And this is one of those guidance surface effect. If you look closely, you can see the, the kind of corrugation type effect here. And that's to alert a blind pedestrian who may be walking this way. When they encounter that surface, they know they need to sort of slide to the right or the left and uh, not proceed beyond that surface. So again, there's, there's no standards or guidance yet for this, but that's something that's being worked on. So hopefully that uh, answered the question that was raised about bike ramps. So let's get back to channelizing devices. We're maybe a little bit behind schedule, so I may pick up the speed or pace a bit, but please don't let that discourage your questions. We talked about pedestrian edging yesterday. I think that was where we ended. Now we're going to turn our attention to channelizing devices. Notice they should be vertical, sturdy, smooth, continuous surfaces, no protruding objects. And notice here, these top surfaces, this is actually the railing for the, the ramp, but here's the channelizing device. The top surfaces are smooth and need to be smooth because low vision pedestrians may use what's called the hand trailing method. They may actually trail their hand on that surface to help guide them along. So certainly you wouldn't want to, you know, if it was wood, for example, you wouldn't want to have splinters in the boards or nails exposed or that sort of thing. So it needs to be a smooth surf smooth continuous surface in terms of channelizing this is what the mutcd says in terms of channelizing pedestrians notice they must be must have a continuous detectable bottom and top surface and the bottom of the bottom surface must be no higher than two inches above the ground the top of the top surface shall be no lower than 32 inches above the ground and that's for channelizers also there shall be no protruding objects that could cause a wheelchair to get stuck or overturn or trip somebody and so this would be a compliant channelizing device notice it has the common vertical plane there's no obstacles in the walkway and the gap between the bottom of the unit and the ground is less than two inches. So these would also be acceptable channelizing devices. How about this project? There's where we're directing pedestrians to a temporary ramp and then into the what had been the parking lane. But notice from the ground to this lower element here is more than two inches. So this would not be a compliant channelizing device. We could make it compliant by doing something like this. Notice just adding this board at the bottom, which is less than two inches off the ground. Of course, this would not be used in the roadway. This would not be a roadway crashworthy device, but used on the sidewalk, it does become a detectable pedestrian channelizing device. Longitudinal channelizing devices have not met the crashworthy requirements for temporary traffic barriers, so we shouldn't use them to shield obstacles or to provide positive protection for pedestrians or workers. You need to keep that in mind. These are these concrete units that you see here. These are temporary traffic barriers, which are devices designed to prevent penetration by vehicles into work areas or pedestrian areas. And these do need to be crashworthy. And also the, the side facing vehicular traffic 
probably needs some, you know, obviously pavement markings, delineation to enhance the visibility for motor vehicle drivers. So I took this a couple of years ago when I was in a city for a conference. And so I don't know anything about the project, but it looks like originally things were good here because it looks like these temporary traffic barriers extended throughout this entire area. And then I'm not sure what happened. Maybe they had to bring a crane in there or something as part of the, it was just a building construction project. But notice, obviously the concrete barriers are removed and these tubular markers are here, but now we lost the detectable edge and we also lost the separation between the pedestrian path and the vehicular traffic. And these tubular markers are certainly not detectable or don't constitute a continuous edge. So hopefully that will be restored with the barriers soon or some other form of channelization installed there. And also please note that unless there's some external steel rails or internal steel framework work, the water filled longitudinal channelizers do not have the capability to redirect vehicles. So we can't substitute them when a barrier is specified. And also keep in mind in terms of these water filled barriers, their deflection characteristics. They deflect much more than the precast concrete barriers. And of course, the concrete barriers can be pinned into place to further reduce their deflection. So I've got some examples here. Many of you are probably familiar with this, maybe all of you. Uh, I rotated it 90 degrees though, so it fit on the slide better. But this is typical application 28 from the MUTCD. And what I wanted to point out, because when I do the in-person training, there's sometimes confusion over this. These devices that are shown here in the MUTCD in app, typical application 28, these are pedestrian channelizers, longitudinal channelizers. These are not temporary traffic barriers. But notice this looks like it's in the city, a two lane street, probably low speed operation. So in that case, having the channelizer is appropriate in my opinion. This drawing comes from the Minnesota DOT temporary traffic manual. Uh, notice the sidewalk is closed here. And so they are routing pedestrians to what had been the parking lane. And you'll see the orange and white devices on both sides of the pedestrian path. Those are channelizers. And notice here in the heading, this is for a low speed roadway, probably in town or in the city. And so that's appropriate. A couple other things I would note. Notice they're showing a minor road, or if it's in a city, it might be an alley perhaps. But notice the curb is missing where the pedestrian path crosses that minor road, and so we need detectable warnings. But notice at the base of the ramp here, where we'd normally put a detectable warning, right? There's no vehicular hazard at this point. So we don't need the detectable warnings at the base of the ramp. We need them where the road crossing is. There was a question about that as well. I hope this discussion answers that. But even though this is a temporary path, it does cross that minor roadway. So we need to have detectable warnings. Now, let me just throw something out. This is not the case here, but imagine as part of the construction, let's say this alley was closed such that there'd be no motor vehicle traffic on it. We'd probably put our channelizers across here. But in that case, if this road is closed as part of construction, then we do not need the detectable warnings because there's no street crossing or road crossing. So that's, that's MnDOT's typical application for a low speed roadway. Now, what about a higher speed roadway or a multi-lane? roadway. This is MnDOT's typical application. And notice here on the sidewalk side, we use channelizers for pedestrians. In fact, we use them here. But then notice when the pedestrians are in the roadway, we use the temporary traffic barriers. And of course, we need a taper and appropriate end treatment or attenuators here at the end. And hopefully there some, would be some delineation on the device itself or pavement markings. 
but that that's the difference between the two these are designed to provide good separation between the pedestrians and the motor vehicles the channelizers of course do not pathway width i think we talked about this a little bit yesterday proag calls for a minimum continuous clear width of four feet or 48 inches but i would recommend 60 because if you're less than 60 you have to provide five foot by five foot passing spaces every 200 feet. Surfaces are important as well. Notice my photo on the left here. There was a sidewalk there and a concrete sidewalk and in the future there will be a new one. But right now, that's just bare earth. And I guess one could argue that, well, you know, if this was out in the desert southwest, maybe at this time of year, that might be baked pretty hard. Or maybe in the wintertime in northern Ohio, that might be frozen solid. But it's not always going to be that way. And that's the key thing. Earth like that, grass, mulch, those are not loose stone. That is not an accessible surface. So it is not appropriate, even temporarily, to route pedestrians over this bare earth surface here. And then we do need to pay attention, as the slide said, to the details. I see this a lot in my travels in urban areas. Uh, you know, they, they did it properly with the ramp and they have channelization and so forth. But at the base of the ramp, somebody wasn't really attentive to the, the drainage. And so every time there's a significant rainfall, you get standing water. And of course, in, in many parts of the United States in the wintertime, that can freeze and turn to ice. And then you have potential slip and fall safety issues. Also, in your alternate route, your alternate access route or your temporary route, we need to pay attention to things like joints and grates and other things that can catch the wheel of a wheelchair or present problems for the tip of a crutch or cane, those sorts of things, walkers. Temporary curb ramps, we may need to put in temporary curb ramps. In fact, I've showed you a couple of examples like in those MnDOT drawings of temporary curb ramps. They should be the full width of the temporary route. I recommend you know, five feet, but a minimum of four. They should be in a single sloped plane, try to minimize warping if they're made out of wood. And we don't normally, of course, talk about handrails at curb ramps, at corners or intersections, but uh, keep in mind here, if the ramp has a rise greater than six inches and a length exceeding 72 inches, we do need handrails on temporary curb ramps. Ramps should be firm, stable, and have a slip resistant surface. So if you're using wood, which would be okay, you may need to do something to enhance the slip resistance of that wood surface. Or similarly, if you're using a metal surface, we probably need to do something texturing or something to enhance slip resistance. We should keep in mind the different types of wheelchairs that may be used in the population. And so the ramp should be strong enough to accommodate them. And probably some color contrasting uh, marking on the edges so that they can be seen by the visually impaired pedestrians. The edge of the ramp can be seen. The transition where you're going up or onto or off of the ramp needs to be flush. Or remember, we talked yesterday, no more than a quarter inch vertical elevation difference. If it's more, if it's between a quarter and a half, then we need to bevel it at 50%. And we do need to have turning spaces at the top and in this case, at the bottom of the ramp, because remember here, people are turning at the bottom of the ramp. In a normal sidewalk environment, people are not turning when they get to the bottom of the ramp. They're just going, proceeding across the crosswalk. But in these temporary areas where pedestrian traffic is channelized, they do have to turn. And the rule is, I don't think we talked about this yesterday, but if an area is unconstrained, the turning space can be four feet by four feet. That means if there's no curb or tow board or kick plate or railing or something such that the footrests can go out beyond the, uh, the path. If it is constrained, and it probably would be constrained in a sidewalk work area, 
then we need to have a five foot by five foot turning space at the top and bottom of the ramp. So here's some examples. How about the one on the right? Looks like a homemade ramp, wooden, that's fine. But my concern is notice this railing or barrier here. I'm not sure that's a five foot uh, dimension there in the direction of travel. So I'm not sure someone in a wheelchair could turn on that turning space. That, that's my concern with that. This railing creates a constrained condition. The footrests have to stop at that railing. And so I'm not, like I said, I'm not sure that's five feet. It needs to be five feet if it's a constrained condition. The image on the left, the person in the wheelchair, that's Scott Windley. Scott works with the access board. I've known Scott for a number of years. I'm not sure this is the same chair he was talking about when I talked to him a few years ago, but at that time, a few years ago, he was commenting to me that the batteries in his power chair, the batteries alone weighed 400 pounds. So if you think about the weight of the batteries plus the weight of the chair plus Scott's weight, you're talking well over 500 pounds for that wheelchair. And I hope Scott was just using this as sort of a photo demonstration because I'm not sure I'd want to traverse that ramp, wooden sheet of plywood even in a manual wheelchair. But that, my point is we do need to recognize that not everybody's in sort of a lightweight manual wheelchair. Some of our wheelchair users are in these heavier power chairs as they're called. And I'm not trying to push a particular product or vendor or anything, but as you're probably aware, there are a number of manufacturers now of these temporary pedestrian modular ramps. And I, I think these are great. They're, this is five feet wide. Notice it has the detectable tow board or kick plate here. It has a railing, the appropriate slope or grade on the ramp. We can bridge over the little gap here up to the sidewalk. This is a quarter inch or less. So it, it complies with PROAG. And at the end of this work, this project can be, uh, or not the project, the ramp can be folded up. I think it weighs on the order of 400 pounds or so, and you can reuse it on other projects. And this, this is a five foot by five foot turning space here, because that is a constrained condition for turning. Sometimes we may need to cover the pathways if there's significant work taking place above the walkway for an extended period of time. This is, of course, to protect pedestrians from falling debris. But we also need to keep in mind anytime there's work overhead above a sidewalk or walkway, we need to have some sort of closure maybe just a short term closure. So even let's imagine a truck pulled in along this roadway and they're lifting concrete panels off the truck onto the building site. It may just take a few minutes or a fraction of an hour to do that. But during that time, we may wanna have, and we should have a flagger or spotter, whatever you wanna call it, on the sidewalk stopping traffic, pedestrian traffic, while that lift is being made over the sidewalk. And again, that person, if they're appropriately trained, they can be an audible cue to the visually impaired person. So they can give audible instructions that way. If you do use the overhead protection, a uh, little bit of difference here. Notice the MUTCD states that a walkway should have a minimum of seven feet of headroom, which is consistent with their what they call for at, to the bottom of signing along the roadway. PROAG calls for 80 inches, as we talked about yesterday. And in these areas, we need to be sensitive to the protruding object hazard potential, because given what's going on and how these overhead protection areas are handled, there may be protruding objects into the pathway. So we need to be alert for that. And here are a couple examples. Notice here that they're probably both these projects, there's extended periods of work overhead. Here we have some scaffolding supporting a roofing structure, and this is our pedestrian path. Uh, this one I kind of like, this is one of those intermodal shipping containers, and they have, looks like, put several of them together, cut some windows in, they have some lighting. Notice there's a detectable edging here along the ground. There's a railing here for folks to 
do the hand trailing, and they may need to uh, beef up the roof structure because these these intermodal trailers typically would not have much of a roof structure. So you may need to beef that up to provide overhead protection. But uh, but I, I kind of like that idea. Sidewalk closures. That may happen quite a bit, right? We're closing a sidewalk completely. Notice what the MUTCD calls for. It says that a barrier, detectable barrier, shall be placed across the full width of the closed sidewalk. Unfortunately, I see this sometimes, and people in their defense will say, well, that's the standard sign. That's in the manual and uniform traffic control devices. Well, that's true, but the problem is that's only part of the picture because that sign is not, the information on that sign is not accessible to someone with a visual impairment. So it could be argued that sign discriminates against the visually impaired. So in addition to the sign, which is fine for, for us sighted people, we need to have, probably here at the beginning of the block, we need to have a detectable barricade across that sidewalk that's detectable by cane. How about this? This is better. Notice nice detectable barricade, plenty of color contrast, nice clearly visible sign for sighted individuals, but notice what's happening. They only got part of the picture here. Apparently they want pedestrians to move into the street, but it looks like there's probably a curb here. So someone in a wheelchair is going to have issues. They're gonna to have to turn around and go, go back. Also all pedestrians notice will be in the roadway with really no separation from traffic. And that's, that's unacceptable. So that there needs to be some sort of channelization here along that uh, parking lane or whatever part of the, might be a travel lane, but in that lane to uh, separate and channelize pedestrians as they go through there. Communication devices, I've alluded to that. Uh, especially when the, the route or the barricade that we may have identified or people are using is not continuous, we may want to provide speech message or audible information to the visually impaired. And these devices, you can see clip-on barricades or drums or other traffic control devices, uh, they detect motion and when they detect motion, they can play a pre-recorded message or some of them may play a message continuously or some of them may have the message uh, activated when pedestrians press a push button. But keep in mind, if you're going to do that, just like uh, our accessible pedestrian signals, the, the push button needs a locator tone that would sound continuously to let the visually impaired know that there is a push button and to help them locate it. I kind of like this here on the right. Uh, notice that, call it the Pedestrian Information Center, where pedestrians can get audible information. But also, as I've alluded to, on certain projects, we can use human beings to provide the audible information. Members of the crew, they can be you know, advised to look for and identify individuals with visual impairments or someone in a wheelchair, who may be having difficulty and they can assist them in navigating the, uh, the pathway. Uh, if you recall, one of the first slides I showed yesterday was Canal Street in New Orleans at a project. This is the other end of that project that I showed you. And I think this fellow was supposed to be a guide because notice it's, it's, there's really no barricades or anything, but pedestrians are not to proceed into the construction area. And that's appropriate, although personally, I thought he should have been located at the closer to the intersection rather than in the middle of the block. Although I believe there's some shops and restaurants here on the left that are still open. So that maybe is why they went into position him where they did. But uh, my only real criticism other than that of him was I was there about 15 minutes while I was observing things and taking some photographs and the darn fellow never turned around. 
And I would say, you know, if you're going to be a guide <laughs> on the lookout for pedestrians and particularly visually impaired and mobility impaired pedestrians, you need to be looking out in the direction where pedestrians are coming from. And this fellow was not doing that. So based on what we've talked about in terms of channelizers, temporary traffic barriers and so forth, here's something to think about in a minute and then I'll share with you my, my thoughts on what I think of this. There's some, I think some good things and then some not so good things here. So note that this is some sort of vertical construction project. It's not a road or street project. The sidewalk is clearly closed. There's a nice wide grass strip or buffer zone between the sidewalk and the street. We've talked about how grass is not an accessible surface. So they built a boardwalk, if you will, from the sidewalk to the street. In fact, they even included a railing here. But notice they did not include some sort of detectable edging here, which I believe is needed. On this side, you don't really need anything because a pedestrian can detect, a visually impaired pedestrian can detect the grass as being different from the, uh, the planks of the, uh, the wooden walking surface. They are in, Pedestrians are in the what had been a parking lane, and notice they put in temporary traffic barriers. However, these need to be continuous and interlocked, and it appears to me that these are not continuous or not interlocked, so I would ding them on that. That's not a good thing. Uh, notice because the we're going from the top of the curb here to the street, we need a ramp and they have a plywood ramp. I'm not sure why they didn't square it off here, something like this. And I am concerned that looks like more than quarter inch plywood, doesn't it? I think that's that needs to be beveled or something there because that lip will be hard for a wheelchair to traverse going in the direction, looking into the, uh, the slide. And they might wanna do something, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of uh, slip resistance on that wood. Uh, here's a good example of notice there is no detectable warning and we don't need one here because there is no conflict with moving motor vehicle traffic. The motor vehicle traffic is kept out by the barricade here. So the fact that there is no detectable warning there is appropriate. And in fact, if one was there, that would be kind of confusing to the visually impaired. Should communicate with the public, especially on bigger, longer term projects. Uh, you know, if you have a big project downtown uh, that might, might last many months or a year or more, maybe we should even have a website to communicate with the public, not both motorists and pedestrians. And particularly on big projects, we may want to have public meetings beforehand to meet with groups of pedestrians that might be affected. For example, I'm aware, I think it was in the Midwest a few years ago, there was a major bridge project, a bridge that went over a railroad yard, a waterway, a roadway down below. I mean, it was a long bridge. And the nearest adjoining bridge was probably half a mile away. And the, the DOT's first thought was, well, we'll just close the bridge. The bridge was old in bad shape. They said, we'll just close the bridge. All pedestrians, able-bodied and disabled, will have to take the detour, you know, walk down to the, the bridge a half mile away and cross that bridge and then walk back. It's not good, but that's what we're going to do. Well, then they had a meeting and it turns out on one side of the bridge, let's say on the east side of the bridge, was a 10-story senior housing structure, high rise, Two blocks away on the west side of the bridge was a pharmacy, like a Walgreens or CVS or something. And at this public meeting, it came out that these seniors said, hey, we need to get to that pharmacy on a regular basis. Not only do we get our medications there, but we get, you know, we can buy some food there. We can buy our other health and beauty need aids that beauty aid needs that we have. And so that's a key part of our life. And which if you think about it, that's that's true. And for, for senior citizens to take a detour of over a mile is probably unreasonable. So the, 
the agreement that they worked out in that particular case, and again, it's going to depend on every case going to be different, but what they did there was I think the DOT ran five days a week from like 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. They ran a van, like a 16 passenger van uh, shuttle service between the high rise and the pharmacy so that people still had access. So my point is that's, you know, that's not a normal project, but in terms of access, sometimes we need to think outside the box. It's not always access via the street system or the roadways. It may be access via, in this case, a, a van, a shuttle van system. So some other considerations and best practices to think about. I recommend, you know, especially on bigger projects, observe existing pedestrian travel and their patterns, which I think will help us maybe come up with a better traffic control plan for pedestrians. And also on bigger projects as well, get input from local pedestrians, especially the disabled community, on what maybe they might have some great ideas on how to handle certain things. And one thing I, I like to, again, on bigger projects is maybe buy a wheelchair, and they're not that expensive, and uh, have you or members of your team or people will be on the project ride through that alternate access route in the wheelchair. In fact, even videotape it. To me, what better way to sort of show you're making a good faith effort to try to comply with PROAG and try to comply with the MUTCD. And if there's any issues with confusion on the route, you can identify those. Any issues with accessibility or you know, openings in grates or something or lips at various locations, all of those can be identified. So just something to think about. We should prioritize routing through the existing walkway if it's safe to do that may have to narrow it or shift it, but that should be the priority. If we can't do that, then think about you know, detouring them to the street or to the other side of the street, or in extreme cases, as I said, think about other options like shuttle service. May need to pay more attention to phasing of construction than we have in the past. For example, build new sidewalks early in larger scale projects. In this project, the sidewalk actually here that we can't see very much of in the background, that's going to be closed for much of a summer for some sort of utility work. And the plan was, well, we'll just detour pedestrians to the sidewalk on the other side of the street. That means over here. But notice this sidewalk had accessibility issues of its own. So phase one of this project is to bring the sidewalk on this side of the street up to accessible condition so that it can serve as the alternate pedestrian access route. Need to be sure we work on only one side of the street at a time, not like this. Notice here, it looks like this is some sort of vertical construction project. This looks like a public works project, but sadly they're being done at the same time. So there's no path for pedestrians. You know, maybe, maybe this side looks like sidewalk repairs here or reconstruction. Maybe that could have been done earlier or later than this work so that we'd have at least one side of the street open for pedestrian travel. So kind of coordination, communication, both with the public and private sector are critical. And then just the education of contractors and others. Uh, this I see more and more, maybe, maybe you do too. Landscaper parking their truck and trailer on the sidewalk. But now that and may be there for a couple hours, but now that sidewalk is closed. And notice in this case, also the bike lane is closed. But we wouldn't allow that on a, a lane of, we wouldn't allow him or her to park for two hours in this right hand lane of traffic. So, I mean, to me, this is, these are lanes of traffic for other users. So we need to keep them open as well. And then here, the contractor simply dumped some loads of stone to create a, access route for his equipment or vehicles to get to a uh, building construction site, but now that sidewalk is inaccessible. And even sometimes you just have to scratch your head. This was 
the standard construction fencing put around a building construction project, but notice behind the fencing is the signal pole and the push button. So now that's an inaccessible push button for not only the disabled, but able-bodied pedestrians as well. Or likewise, you know, just using the sidewalk for storage. And I can tell you there's this is the only sidewalk on this street. There's no sidewalk on the other side of the street. So this has created issues for both able-bodied and disabled pedestrians. And then this is one of our challenges. I don't know that there's, from what I see here, I'm not sure of a good solution, but the MUTCD requires the appropriate uh, warning signs and such devices for motor vehicle traffic. But notice by placing this road work sign here, this sidewalk is now inaccessible. So that's also a violation of PROAG and the MUTCD. So we need to think about that. Maybe there's a pole nearby that we could put that sign on or something. But these are, in some cases, real challenges for us. How do, how do we handle those situations? And it, to me, it calls for some sort of outside the box thinking sometimes to come up with good solutions for these. Uh, situations. Uh, these, here's a work area at the end of a crosswalk. These are certainly not detectable, although I guess this, this fellow I think is sawing the pavement, so he or she would be detectable while, while that saw is operating because a visually impaired pedestrian could hear that and know that something's going on. But if that person takes a break or stops running the saw, we're leading pedestrians, visually impaired pedestrians into the equipment and work area. So really what's needed here is a barricade so that folks can't even enter that crosswalk and then detour them to the other side of the, the street. Uh, this is sad, this lift remained in that position over a three day holiday weekend while a community was having its big arts festival and the one reason I show both of these slides is that uh, I don't think I've mentioned it, but the DOJ and the courts through their actions and decisions are basically telling us that curb ramps are the basic element of accessibility. So top priority should be given to curb ramps. So it's kind of sad here that neither of these curb ramps really much attention was given to those curb ramps or a detour route, even though that they should be our top priority. Those of you with local agencies, think about revising your policy to include accessible and detectable alternate pathways for pedestrians and then enforce those policies. So with that, I don't know we'll be able to get through all of these, but uh, I do have some examples here and we'll look at, you know, what do you think, ask you to sort of think about them and then I'll share with you my thoughts on these are some temporary traffic control installations that I've uh, photographed around the country. I don't really know anything about the projects other than I was a you know, observer, happened to be in town and uh, recorded them photographically. But here's the case one. I think this is probably pretty common, especially, well, probably in any size community. Uh, the gas company removed the sidewalk and excavated a trench to repair a section of gas line. After the work was done, they backfilled the trench and put a stone surface. And then the way they work, and this is probably true in many places around the country, they notified a concrete contractor who they have an agreement with. And that entity has three weeks to place and finish the concrete, restore the sidewalk. The sidewalk's downtown, but outside of the core business district, has maybe a handful of pedestrians per hour, but it is near a museum. And so I'll ask you, is the sidewalk shown accessible and how might we handle this? So there's the situation. This is where the gas company worked. This fact, this is how the gas company left it. And as I said, the concrete contractor has three weeks to come in and restore that concrete. We're getting some comments in the question box, which I'll read off to you. And okay. anyone else who would like to comment on this scenario, um, one person already put in there that it's not accessible. Um, someone else said that it needs a hard surface, trim the trees. 
Um, and someone else commented that they feel like there needs to be additional ADA training provided to utility crews and building crews. Yeah, good. Good. All three are good comments, especially that last one. I, I, I like that and I agree with that fully. I think in all the in-person training I've done uh, over the last, say, couple of years, I think I've had one person from a telecommunication company in the class, and that was about the only, you know, I'll call them a utility, that was the only utility. But yeah, I agree that it needs to be better training. And whoever made the comment about the trimming the shrubs, you're spot on, good eyes, uh, that's probably not four feet there, right? So those, those shrubs need to be trimmed back. Yeah, and what I would recommend here, as someone said, maybe the gas company needs to be taught or educated or required that they should put maybe a, some sort of cold patch or something here. So at least it's a hard surface. It may not be the best surface, but at least it's a hard surface. And then when the concrete company comes in, they can remove that and restore the finished concrete. I guess you could also put some planking of some sort or metal plates over there. But the key point is, as several of you said, that loose stone is not an accessible surface. Uh, this is actually the same area the next day. There, there's that stone. But I came back the next day, and this is an example of what I just mentioned a few minutes ago. The gas company is now down the street. They're not even in the sidewalk. But to comply with the MUTCD, because they have a flagger down the road, they need to put up the advance warning signs. Well, now this flagger warning sign is making that sidewalk further inaccessible than just the, the loose stone or the, the overgrown shrub. Uh, and this is a tough one too, because this is a driveway to the museum, so we can't put the sign here. You can see there's landscaping here. Maybe we could put a sign on the, the pole here. I don't think the street's wide enough to put the sign in the street. So again, this is a, a challenge that we face. Or here's another one. Those of you with local agencies, I'm sure face this on a regular basis. We replace a slab. And uh, I guess I'll ask here, how long would your agency need to handle this operation? Was it someone said to plate it. Um, someone, else, someone in the comments said to plate it. Okay, someone yeah. Said that the hydrant is actually an obstruction. That's right. Yeah, when I ask that question in in-person classes, I get answers from anywhere from like one day to one week. But I think we might think about how can, is there some way we can speed up the construction process to sort of get in and get out quickly and not uh, be too disruptive to pedestrians? I, I'm not familiar with this project, but no, it looks this must have been here a while, because would you agree with me? You can almost see a goat path being created there in, in the grass for the able-bodied pedestrians. But think about someone in a wheelchair or someone who's blind, they're going to have to, they have some issues here. Let's maybe do one more and then we'll open it up to questions. This is a Midwestern city, about 10, about 100,000 population, state office building, getting some new desks and furniture and such. And they're moving out the old furniture in the morning and then the new furniture in in the afternoon. There was a five person crew working this job and they were using a couple wheeled dollies. And they blocked off some parking in front of the building so the delivery truck could park. And I took this picture about 12.15. I was on my lunch break from a training class and the crew was also on their lunch break. So how, how might you handle this? This is what I encountered. This is the traffic control they had set up. Notice they have the barricades, but of course these are not detectable by pedestrians. I guess they did not have a right arrow, so they turned the sidewalk close sign upside down to give them a right arrow. And you can see, I guess at the start of the work, there was some caution tape set up, but a lot of it is now on the, on the ground. <laughs> One recommendation we've gotten is that they should have person guides. Absolutely. That's my recommendation, too. Yep. Yeah. Why? This is sort of overkill, I think. And now you have an issue out there when nobody's present. Yeah. Why not just rely on a, 
a person. You can call them a flagger even if you would, could even have a stop slope paddle. But that person could be advised if they observe a visually impaired pedestrian, then they need to use audible communication to communicate with the uh, with the public with the, the pedestrian public. So good, yeah, I agree with that. That why don't I stop here, maybe Victoria, and we'll take questions that may have come in sure. during the session. And we have quite a few of them, so you probably won't get to all, but I will read some off, and then be assured that I'll be emailing these over to Ron after um, the webinar concludes, and that he will reach out to you directly um, to discuss your questions. So. One person said, we are designing a pedestrian bridge over a roadway with sidewalks. We will need to temporarily close the roadway and sidewalks while setting the truss. Is There is not a feasible detour for pedestrians due to a creek. Is there guidance on closing sidewalks for a half day construction period? Oh, that's a very good question. And that's, that's one of those gray areas and uh, Kind of it depends, but it's just if it's just a half a day, uh, and you're closing it to everybody, that I mean it may not be the best thing, but it's probably not a proag violation. But one thing I guess I would caution you maybe to look at because I don't know what's on sort of either side of the the bridge, but are there pedestrian generators or like I mentioned a senior housing facility or a pharmacy or some government facility or even a large residential area where you may have some disabled individuals living. You might want to do a little bit of outreach or checking just to make sure uh, about that and if there are, if those folks might need any sort of special accommodation. But uh, And I would document whatever I did. It sounds like you've documented sort of the technical infeasibility, which is a good thing. But I'd, be, I'd even document if you do some sort of try to reach out to the public or communication or determine who might need to actually travel during that period, that would be good to document that to show that you made a good faith effort in attempting to, to deal with the issue. Okay, one more question here. As a designer, what is the best method to ensure that contractors follow PROAG and ADA guidelines? Is there a recommended note? Oh, uh, that's, I would say maybe, maybe sort of enforcement, you know, make, make sure that uh, if it's not the proper cross slope or not the proper grade on a ramp or a turning space that's not proper. I mean, try to, you know, enforce that and make, I hate to say this, but you make it, if it's in there, make them take it out and, and put it back correctly. That, you know, that sort of extra time and expense hopefully should make the point or encourage them to, uh, to get training on curb ramps, pro ag, so forth, and it's. Uh, I think we do have some contractors here at the session today, which is good. But oftentimes, I know when I teach the in-person classes, just like with utilities, it's hard to get the contractors, or the actual folks who are on the ground setting the forms or finishing the concrete, to attend training. But if there's some way you could, uh, I don't encourage them to to do that. Uh, that that would also, I think, go a long way. Because my feeling is, if these folks are good craftspeople, they know what they're doing. They do good work. But oftentimes, the issue is they don't really understand kind of what we're striving for, or what sort of user we're designing for, or what the uh, the criteria are. Where I think if maybe if if they have a little knowledge of that, they can come up with some good solutions too, and help us achieve what we're trying to achieve here in the public right of way. Ron, it sounds like you need to put them in the wheelchair and take them out there too. Well, that would be great. Yeah, if we could do that. <laughs> yep. Well, we are like a minute from 11 and I don't want to um, run over time. So I want to thank you so much. And we did have one question, if you would be willing to, um, could you type up responses to the, the questions that have been, the general questions that have been asked that I could share back out with everybody since we didn't get to all of them? Sure. Sure. Well, that'd be fantastic. Thank you, yeah. Ron. So and those that have individual questions, it may not be, it may be next week, but I will get back with everybody with answering your, your individual questions as well. 
That's fantastic. We really appreciate that and you sharing your knowledge and, and all of your photos. I'll um, have to make sure that we make sure we go with you when you're visiting Columbus next time to see what areas you decide would be <laughs> good photos to include for your presentations. So, all right, well, thanks again. And thank you all of you who have joined us. This is such an important topic and you never know when it might be you who is the person who needs to do the crossing in those areas. So we appreciate your time and your effort and focus on making sure everybody has access to our system. So take care and we hope to see you on a future webinar. Yeah, thank you again.